was a fall I day. I graduated. It was, you know, like I was a final great day. Deserved. And that was nice of her. That, what that, was, through that was great. Help other people too. My name is Cheryl Green, and I will be your host this evening. Hey, Zach. Uh, for Intersections, an evening of storytelling about identity, culture, community, and pride. Tonight you are going to hear some very riveting stories from PSU students, faculty, and staff who are all members of underrepresented cultures, communities, and identity groups. We're here to highlight and to celebrate our differences as well as our shared experiences within and around the places where our individual and collective identities intersect. <laughs> Eli Clare wrote a book called Exile and Pride. In it, he says that gender reaches into disability. Disability wraps around class. Class strains against my notes. Class strains against abuse. Abuse snarls into sexuality. And sexuality folds on top of race. Everything finally piling into a single human body. To write about any aspect of identity, any aspect of the body, means writing about this entire maze. And that is a part of why tonight's event is called Intersections. So I'm a graduate of the Speech and Hearing Sciences Master's program here at Portland State. I don't know why I have to look at my notes to say that part. <laughs> However, I am not a speech and hearing scientist. I'm not a rehabilitation clinician like I was trained to become. I'm actually a media artist focusing on film, blogging, podcasting, and disability access. I graduated in 2009 and acquired a disability in 2010. And so instead of going into the rehab field, I became more active in a very rich, vibrant disability arts and justice community here in Portland. Now one thing my media explores is how rehab and medicine are often practiced in ways that erase or devalue many people's identities. And the best way to counter that erasure is to gather with people from underrepresented groups and make the space for everyone to share who they are for themselves. And so that's why I'm here tonight with you and our wonderful lineup of storytellers there. As you know, this evening's event is part of Social Sustainability Month and Portland State of Mind, which we're very excited to be a part of. And you can find out more about Social Sustainability Month and Portland State of Mind online at pdx.edu. So now a few quick housekeeping notes. Some sensitive topics will come up tonight. If at any point something that a storyteller is saying feels too heavy or too close to home, please know that it is fine to step out of the room to take care of yourself. Each storyteller will tell their own personal experiences. They are not meant to be representative of everyone with similar identities, communities, or cultures, nor are tonight's storytellers the voice of any given community. And with that, I am excited to introduce to you our first storyteller, Jules Harris. Jules Harris is a counselor in the Disability Resource Center at PSU, where she provides support for students with disabilities and works to make the university accessible for all. Jules, who holds an MA in counseling from PSU, was in private practice counseling individuals and couples as they manage the impact of disability on their lives. She also worked extensively with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and was a leader on their Parents with MS project. Jewel served on the Portland Commission on Disability for over four years and has been actively involved in disability rights movements for nearly 10 years. So New Year's 2005, after a really rough couple of years, I thought, okay, I got this. I'd been through a really, let's face it, a really not so nice divorce. And um, I finally was on track. I was working full time. I was applying for graduate school in a career that I knew I was gonna love. And then, by the end of, no, of that first month of 2005, by the end of January, I went within 10 days from tripping as I was getting on the bus to in the hospital, not able to walk. I was so scared. 
I was a single mom. I had two amazing, beautiful kids. Noah was 11 and Mariah was 8. And I thought to myself, how the hell am I going to raise these kids? But you know what? Not working gave me the chance to do something that, as a single mom, most don't ever get to do. I got to be involved in my kids' lives in a way that most, most married moms don't get to do. I got to volunteer in the classroom. That meant that uh, I remembered the stringy-haired little girl that was really not very nice to my daughter and the blonde with the really cute hair and the curls and the freckles who was very shy but underneath had this sort of wicked sense of humor, and the uh, little brat who picked his nose and wiped it on the girl in front of him, and I knew he did it even though he denied it. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I got to do all of that. But the thing I remember the most was field trips. Now, my son, he was in, a, um, in a, an environmental science middle school, which meant that we had field trips every other week. And we got to go, you know, working on these public service projects and plant trees and rip out invasive species and, you know, go explore things and go to nature preserves and do all these things. One field trip that I really remember, though, was in um, Lacamas Park. It was a fall day. It was, it was a great day. There was dried leaves all over the ground. And, um, and uh, as we were walking, I can hear this crunching, crunching sound. Oh. And then... Um, We'd been hiking, we were going by the creek, planting species of good trees, ripping out species of bad, crappy grass. Uh, but by the end of the day, my body had it. It was just done. And I was having a hard time walking, which would happen. And my then 13-year-old son came up to me and uh, kind of took my elbow, held my hand, like he used to do, and walked with me. And as we're walking, I'm hearing that crunch, crunch, crunch sound of the leaves. And I'm remembering when he was three, and we used to go crunching, that's what I called it. We'd go crunching, walking through the leaves and making as much noise as we possibly could. And now I'm walking with him, crunching in a very different way. And I'm looking at this now as tall as me, very sensitive kind boy, and feeling very, very proud and very worried. Because I'm looking also ahead at all the other kids running around in front and their parents just kind of following behind and Nobody else was holding mommy's hand. And I worried that I'm taking away something from him. That he would be embarrassed. That, you know, he has to take care of me instead of the other way around. And For some reason, that sticks in my mind as this moment of great joy and pride for my kid and worry for the mom that I am. So three years later, <laughs> um, my daughter had a field trip. She's 13 now. And uh, she did go to an environmental science middle school where we got to go on field trips all the time. Um, she went to a regular middle school where we had two field trips a year if you were lucky. And um, the field trip that all of the parent volunteers fought to go on was the oceanography field trip. You know, the one where you loaded up into buses very early in the morning and went and looked at tide pools and stuff. Well, I got to go. I was so excited. She was too. 
she even admitted it. And um, we were uh, we were going there. We had to drive separately because there wasn't a lot of room in the buses, and we were running late because late is kind of my thing. I'm not very good at being on time. Uh, and we got lost because that's also kind of my thing. I tend to get lost. But we, you know, we're driving around, and I can't find these stupid buses. I don't know where they went. But I know they've got to be here somewhere. We finally find them. We park. And we rush. And we get out of the car. And we run up. And then I'm like, oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me. There's this 35-foot long, rickety-ass stairway going down to the beach. Like, and boulders. And, like, just precarious, to say the least. And my daughter kind of looked at me. She's like, you got this, Mom? And I was thinking about what the last five years had been like for her. You know, we had a lot of times when, when I said I was going to do something, and then my body decided it wasn't going to. And it's pretty hard for a kid to understand sometimes. Times when... I really wanted to. We really thought we were going to, but I was just too fucking tired. So we didn't. And I thought, not today. Today, I'm coming through. Today, I'm watching my daughter go on down in front of me, and I'm making my way down there slowly. I have these um, wonky leg braces on. They're um, plastic, like really hard plastic. And they kind of look like boots, only nowhere near as classy as these guys. And they don't move very well. And they had these Velcro straps that went around the front that always came off. And they were kind of a pain. Anyway, made my way down to the beach, some of it on my ass. But I made it. And it was a really great day. We got to look at tide pools. And I get my daughter excitedly calling me over to look at something. We went into this estuary and crawled around and looked at stuff. It was wonderful. It's been a long time since that 2005 New Year's. It's been through a lot of changes, a lot of different things. I've used every mobility device out there. I've had a wheelchair, I've had a walker, I've had canes, I've had two canes, I've had crutches, I've had leg braces. And I'm doing great right now. It's been 10 years since that first MS attack when I didn't know what the hell was going to happen. But it's still unpredictable. About six weeks ago, we were getting my daughter ready for a big backpacking trip. She was so excited. And we were running all over the place, all over town, getting this thing and that thing and this thing. And we were at REI, and it had been a busy time. And I'd been going and 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 going, because that's sort of the way I am. I know two speeds, on and off, <laughs> generally. Um, and uh, I start limping in REI. You know, my legs kind of going behind me, and dragon and my hand starts to claw up the way it does and and my daughter comes up to me just really sweet she just takes my arm holds my hand she goes mom do you need some help out to the car I'm like yeah yeah bugs I I, I could use that 
so she helps me out to the car. And uh, I get home, and my son just happens to be there, and he helps me up the ramp into the house and get over the door, and my legs just kind of fold in on themselves, and I'm down. And I uh, realized that I don't want to go back to where I've been, but I could. I realize that I'm very grateful for where I am, but I'm also really grateful for where I've been. My son's 20 now, my daughter's 17. Shortly after Noah turned 20, I asked him, dude, what was that like? You know, all those field trips when I couldn't walk sometimes and you'd have to hold my hand and help me and were you embarrassed? Were you, was that hard for you? And he said, nah, I just figured if anybody had a problem with it, fuck them. I'm just, I'm just happy you were there. So was I. Our next storyteller is Tassara Dudley. Tassara Dudley is a poet and educator, attending PSU in pursuit of a Black Studies degree. Tassara coordinates their university's LGBTQ Speakers Bureau, volunteers time for the Vanport Multimedia Project, and is a contributing writer for two online magazines. They're currently working on a self-published book of poems. Between my seventh and eighth birthdays, my father began to use a wheelchair. And between my eighth and ninth, he died. When I was growing up, it had always been an accepted part of life that sickness was there. Um, my father had diabetes. His mother had had diabetes, and he checked his blood sugar and took his insulin at the table. It was just part of our meal ritual. And it never occurred to me that he wouldn't be there doing that. I had this childish idea that my father was immortal, that he'd always be there for me. But the first year, that we had Thanksgiving at my family's house. I lost him. Things had been rocky, but we'd adjusted to every change. When he began to use a wheelchair, we adjusted to that. There was a game my brother and I had of trying to push him up the giant hill to Kaiser to see his doctor. And when he moved from my parents' bedroom to a hospital bed in the living room, that made sense. Uh, he needed the hospital bed because it would raise and lower and he could control that. And it only fit one person, so my mom was in the, in the bedroom and my dad was in the living room and that made sense. And this nurse started coming to our house to help him adjust to each new change. And that was nice of her. That was, that was great. And just two nights before Thanksgiving, they brought these giant oxygen tanks. My father hated them, and he was constantly complaining about them. And the night before Thanksgiving, he left the nose piece out Overnight, the entire house filled with pure oxygen. 
so that on Thanksgiving morning, we were all sick. Everybody woke up sick. My mom's running around trying to get the food done and make sure everything's ready, and my father wasn't waking up. He was lying in bed and groaning in his sleep. And I know that I threw up all over the bathroom and my poor mom had to clean it up, which she did. As soon as our friends started arriving, I got shuffled to the bedroom. I didn't know what was going on. All the adults were very tightly in control of their emotions and they wanted to play board games with me. I wanted to see my father, but they wouldn't let me out. At some point, I realized what was happening. I remember climbing up on the end of my bed and pressing my face up to the glass, trying to peer down, just squishing my whole face, just so that I could catch a glimpse of the two paramedics who were taking my father away under a white sheet. But because things have to go on, we did. My mom kept working until when I was 10, she started getting sick. And I was terrified. I was so scared that I was going to lose my mother as well. My brother was away at summer camp one year and he he was gone and my mom woke up in the middle of the night with chest pain and drove herself to the emergency room. I remember sitting up the entire rest of the night watching reruns on TV, didn't matter what, because I wasn't watching, I was crying. She made it through that and after physical therapy. She can do lots of things, but she'll never really be the way that she was before. Part of why I work so hard is that I have this dream of one day my mom can retire and she can live in a house and not have to worry about paying rent and then I can take care of her. I, I watch her, she's working three jobs to support my brother, and I work all the jobs that I can. I'm going to school, <coughs> I'm working here at the university. And I've been pushing and pushing. Last fall, I failed all of my classes And in the middle of that, I got a diabetes diagnosis. And I'd always assumed I would get diabetes because my father had it and his mother had it. And I always just thought that I was probably going to get it too. And when I got my blood sugar back under control, I went in seeing a counselor. I got an ADHD diagnosis. And that was great too because all these things that I'd been struggling with for so long were making sense that I, I, it wasn't that I was lazy or stupid. It was that I couldn't focus. And, and I got treatment for that and things were doing better and I thought that things were gonna be all right and then I started getting sick again. I struggle so hard with it. This cultural idea that you have to keep working, you have to keep going no matter what. And you know, people see you and they're like, have you tried yoga? <laughs> Do you eat enough vegetables? You know, if, you, if you drink enough water, you won't get headaches anymore. Everything will be all right. But it's not true. It isn't. And I've been pushing and trying for so long, just trying to make it true. But I can't push anymore. And I, 
I don't know what to do with that. What do I, what, where, do, where does my dream of my mother retiring go when I can't, when I can't make enough money to make it happen? And she can't make enough money to make it happen. But I also have to recognize the fact that I can't do it right now. Maybe it will get better eventually, but right now I've got to learn to let that go. I can't beat myself up about the fact that my body is saying no. I have this tattoo that says, Radical Self begins with radical self-love. It's a reminder that I have all these lofty dreams to change the world, but if I run myself down in the pursuit of those dreams, I'll never get there. So what I have to do now is really to let it be okay on the days that I can't do everything, that it can't be superhuman, and treat myself with gentleness and compassion. I'm learning to be gentle with myself. Next storyteller is Areli Lopez. Areli Lopez was born in Guatemala and lived there for 18 years. She's the oldest child in her family and a first generation student attending college. Areli has worked as a student advocate at the Women's Resource Center at Portland Community College, Rock Creek, which led her to pursue a major in child and family studies at Portland State University. Areli plans to apply for the Teach for America program and gain more experience working with children, youth, and families. She also aims to apply for her master's degree in social work or education and teaching. Areli is proud to say that with God's help and the encouragement of her family and others who have mentored her, she has overcome many challenges in school and throughout life. As a first generation and low income college student, continuing her education has been a challenge. But as a college student and leader, she is confident, responsible, determined and motivated to accomplish her educational goals and to serve her community. In the beginning of 2008, I was very excited to start the new year. I had many plans, many goals, including graduating from high school getting a job, getting married, and maybe continue college. Everything changed in March 2008 when my family left from Guatemala to the United States. And it was because um, my dad came to the United States in 1988 and he he was resident here in the United States, and he will go back and forth. And when he will go back, I have four siblings. So, as you will guess, my mom stayed pregnant. <laughs> and, then, and then he will he will leave. I was the first child in my family, so I had many responsibilities as. My mom, I was raised with, with my mom, and so um, my parents got to the point that if our lives was gonna continue like that. And so um, my dad applied for my family's visas, and in 2008, we got our, our visas to come to the United States. That was my last year uh, going to high school and the education system in Guatemala is different because it starts in January and ends in October. So that year I went to live with my uncle 
in the city because we used to live up in the hill. And so um, I would go to visit my family once a week, every weekend or every other week. And so when my family left from from Guatemala, I was I was sad. I missed them, but I didn't feel you know that I was missing them a lot. I guess. Um, Fifteen days after my family left from from Guatemala, I well I. By the way, I was undecided. I knew that I was gonna see my family. I, I didn't know when and where. I, I thought that maybe they will come back, like my dad or something like that. But 15 days after they left, my parents told, asked me to go to my house and water or flowers, and so I take the bus on Saturday, and I travel for about an hour, and I get I get to my home, and the first place where I where I get is to to the kitchen, and I come inside, and I see everything was empty. There were no dishes. I look at the table. I remember my siblings coming to eat and laugh and share everything. And now there was nobody. And I remember my mom asking me, can you wash the dishes, or can you this or that? And, and I'll say, okay, mom, I'll do it later, and I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I go to the living room, and I look around, and everything was empty, sad, and silent. I look at the walls, there were no pictures. I look at the couch and there was nothing. I remember my neighbors or my extended family coming to visit us and now there was nothing. So I come outside and, and I come to the flowers and many of them were dying. And I remember my mom watering, watering the flowers. And at that moment, I realized that I really missed my family, that I needed them. Well, I was thinking about it. I see my dog coming, medium black dog coming and His name was Gusano, and he looks at me, telling me, where is everyone? Why are you by yourself here? And so I look at him, and I tell him, I'm sorry, Gusano. I'm sorry I had to leave you, too. I miss them, too. So um, my dog, he he stayed at home because he wouldn't stay in another house. So my neighbors, they would go and feed him. In September, I I pay my ticket to to come to the United States, and I I graduated in October from high school. It was a big accomplishment because um, when I was going to school as women in Guatemala, I was told that I was wasting my money, my time, but I showed them. I proved that I, I could do it. Um, 
I was praying through this process and in November I come to the United States. I was very happy to see my family again. And when I see my siblings in the airport, I my brothers they are taller than me and my mom and I was very happy to see them. And days later, I realized that coming to the United States, it was like, like I was born again. I come to a new culture, new language, new weather, new food, new house. Everything was new, but my family was here, and that's all that I needed. I have been through many challenges, including discrimination, but I'm very thankful <coughs> to God and to my family and many people who have mentored me. I I'm going to be graduating next year with my bachelor's degree in Child and Family Studies. I completed my international capstone in Nicaragua this past summer. I am bilingual, so you can hear me speaking in English. I didn't know English when I came to the United States. And um, I have a 3.5 GPA. And now I, I realize that I accomplished one goal that I had, but I have get to the point that God had better plans for me. I had my own plans, my own goals, but God had better ones for me. And so when when I am not accomplishing my goals or when I am struggling, I have to pray and believe that there are better ones coming. There are better things coming. Thank you. So our next storyteller is Candace Avalos. Candace Avalos is a Virginian turned Oregonian as she finished her master's degree in higher education administration last year at James Madison University and moved to Portland for her job at PSU. She's the current coordinator of student government relations and Greek life advisor and works in the student activities and leadership programs department on campus. Candace identifies as Black Tina from her half African American, half Guatemalan, Guatemalan heritage and she is known for her wildly curly hair and equally curly personality across the country as she traveled to various nerdy conferences and internships in her undergraduate and graduate school years. She is a student government nerd, proud sorority woman of Delta Gamma, and a lover of all things cats. <laughs> yes, I wrote that really cool syndrome. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. October 2nd, 2012. It was my 24th birthday. Super excited. I'm in grad school. You know, time of my life, whatever. And it's my birthday, so I'm going to have fun, right? So I'm kind of getting ready in my apartment and thinking about what I'm going to do. And I realized I had bought myself an early present, which I have here. So on a grad school budget, 40 bucks is pretty steep. But I spent 40 bucks on this bad boy. It's a scale. Uh, I hadn't really weighed myself in some time, and I was looking at my Facebook pictures and noticing I was just getting a little bit chunkier each one. I was like, oh, 
damn it. I should probably know my number and figure this out. So, on my birthday, I take this thing out and go to my dingy bathroom and there's like this tiny freaking square of hardwood floor that I can actually use the scale on and I step on. So that was my first pivotal moment. I step on the scale. It's got this little light blue light on it. And I step on and calculates my weight. And it says, you ready for it? You're all like waiting. 345 pounds. As you can imagine, I was scared, surprised, but not that surprised, let's be honest, and lots of thoughts were racing through my head. So I step off the scale, walk over to my room, and I sit on my bed. Then all of a sudden, my cat walks in. I told you I was a lover of all things cats. And my cat, her name is Muñeca, which means baby doll in Spanish. It also means wrist, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> um, <laughs> and she walks in, she's like, meow, meow, meow. She's just always meowing, like the meow, what is that, that meow mix commercial? That's my cat. <laughs> she's this little chunky cat. She's all black, but she's got these white whiskers. And everyone always asks me, has she always had white whiskers? I don't remember. I don't think so. She's old now. Um, but I've had this cat since I was about 10. So she has seen my entire life, really, through elementary school, middle school, high school, college, <coughs> now I'm in grad school, and I still have this cat. And I realized in that moment, looking at her, that she's kind of a reflection of me. We've both been through the same things, our hard times, my mom's divorces, family drama, puberty, my God. And she has grown and changed like I have. She would lose some weight, she would gain some weight, you know, she'd lose her hair. I didn't lose my hair. I don't think. Not yet. But I was just in this moment, you know, I'm in this just pensive thinking, oh my gosh, I'm 345 freaking pounds, and what am I going to do about it? This is supposed to be, you know, 24. It's like you're healthy and life is happening and whatever, but nope, not me. So... <clears throat> You know, I was always, I was never really a small girl. I was always kind of bigger. And, I mean, in second grade, I had, like, boobs and an ass. I mean, nobody in second grade has boobs and an ass. I did. <laughs> so when you're comparing your body to other people, um, especially where I grew up, I grew up in northern Virginia, um, you know, suburban white towns, and everyone's skinny and white and blonde. Yeah. I don't look like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm the opposite. I'm chubby, I'm brown, I got this crazy curly hair. So I never really fit the standard model. And it was just impossible to live up to some of those standards. So I felt like, why bother? Give me the rice and beans, I'll eat them all. <laughs> and I did. <coughs> That's how I got here. FYI. So, anyway. It's my birthday, right? So just, I'm going to repress it. Just Freudian style. Let's not think about this. I'll Google diets later. <laughs> so, went through my day, you know. I did actually Google diets. And have you Googled diets? It's ridiculous, okay? <laughs> Kale is gross. I'm sorry. I'm not going to eat it. 
like Tassara was saying, do yoga. Okay, sure, right. <laughs> Eat a salad. Yeah, that, that, that shit doesn't work. I'm sorry. <laughs> Especially on this grad school budget of mine. I mean, okay, pasta is 50 cents. <laughs> tomatoes, $3. Come on, you do the math, right? I'm going to eat the pasta. So I continued on. Fast forward. I'm grad schooling it up. And I'm about to graduate. And I'm stressed. I'm trying to work on my thesis. I'm like, where am I going to work? You know, I'm trying to figure out my life. And uh, I'm starting to feel weird. I'm noticing that my hands, they're numb. Sometimes numb all day. I'm sweaty and thirsty. I have to go to the bathroom every five freaking seconds. And thinking to myself, you know, I'm just stressed out. It's grad school. I'm probably just my body is out of whack. So back to Freud, repress, repress. And I just try to get through it. So I graduate on May 3rd, 2013. Thanks for snaps like that. And then three days later, I'm on a plane flying across the country to Portland, Oregon. I'm here for my interview, interviewing for the job I currently have. And let me just say, that flight was awful. Because we're on a budget in South, so cheapest flight equals three stops, right? So I'm traveling for like 18 hours, finally get here, it's midnight, so it's 3 a.m. my time, I'm like, oh my god, I have this interview at 9 a.m., I'm stressed out, and the whole flight, I'm just, gotta go to the bathroom, and I'm sweaty, all those signs, right? So, I get the job, and I fly back, and I'm like, okay, one month, I've got one month to figure out what to do, move over to Portland, and start this brand new life. I got my dream job, something that I've wanted in a profession that I love. You know, student affairs, it's a profession where we teach these students to become who they are and to trust themselves and to love themselves and take care of themselves. And I had that realization that I wasn't doing that for me. I wasn't taking care of me. And before I could take care of anyone else, I needed to do me first. So here came my second pivotal moment. I go to the doctor, walk in. It's this doctor that I haven't seen in years because I was in college and grad school and I wasn't going to make the trip up to my doctor. And so I don't have a relationship with her do all these tests, here come the test results, and I knew it, I knew it was coming. I was diagnosed with diabetes. <sighs> Trying to get together here, give me a second. My blood, my blood sugar was through the fucking roof. To put it into perspective, someone with a normal blood sugar, they have a 5.7. I had a 14. I'm thankful I'm alive. If I would have waited any longer, I don't know if I would be here. I could have lost my limbs, could have died, gone in a coma. So I had to change my life. Days are ticking away and I'm moving to Portland and I don't know anyone here and I gotta restart my life, build a new community. I mean, I was that annoying girl on campus, always running for office, so I, everyone knew me, right? Oh God, she's running for president again. Just vote for her. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm in Portland, they're like, who's crazy Valentina? What is 
she going from? So, <laughs> so I'm stressed, as you can imagine. And so the doctors, they, they're like, hey, here's some Prozac. You need this shit. So, <laughs> flying, back, flying over here to Portland with some Prozac, all drugged up. And I'm ready. You know what? I'm taking control of my life. It's time. As you might know, if someone um, gets diabetes at the beginning, it's a drastic weight loss. We lost 30 pounds immediately out of nowhere. And then, but my sugar, it's stabilized. Just one month, and I brought it down to an 11. Three months later, I'm at a six. Almost completely eradicated my diabetes. And I'm a new person. Stand here today, about 70 ish pounds lighter than I was last year. I found communities to support me through this journey. PSU is freaking fantastic. I love my office and the people there. I love the people at Portland State and in Portland. Got connected with my sorority and joined a CrossFit gym. <laughs> you do a lot of that. <laughs> Not gonna do a squat whose jeans are too tight. <laughs> but, you know, I have it together now and I'm finally who I want to be. This story, it really, it's not about weight loss. It's not about the scale. It's about wellness. But even better than that, it's, it's about feeling like I finally deserved wellness. I deserved to love myself and be loved. And if you're wondering how my cat, Muñeca, is doing, <laughs> she's finally happy. Thank you. We have one last storyteller this evening, Lisa Napton. Lisa Napton is a native Oregonian who, after living most of her adult life outside of the state, rehomed herself back to Portland a few years ago. She has dual bachelor's degrees in psychology and sociology. Social work and advocacy for, for people with disabilities has been a career and a passion. Lisa identifies as a deaf person and enjoys breaking down barriers and stereotypes. Through the advances of modern medicine, Lisa and another little person call herself Mommy. She recently enjoyed several years taking American Sign Language at Mount Hood Community College. Lisa currently attends PSU full-time to pursue a master's degree in social work. Stand up and stretch for a moment. morning, 16 years ago, I'm getting ready for surgery. This is my final surgery. I've already had seven. I'm in my hospital gown. 
I've given my hearing aids to my mother. I'm lying on the white hospital gurney. I can feel the sheets scratchy. I feel like wool, like a, like a wool sweater that you can't take off. be wheeled down the hospital corridor, and the only thing I can see are the lights spaced along the ceiling, bright white fluorescent lights, glaring. I turn to look at the wall, which is also white, sterile. I can see a few interspersed Christmas decorations. They're old and ugly, used. They don't make me feel festive. <laughs> but obviously the hospital wants to put something up for the patients. Looking around, I can see the man who's pushing me on the gurney. He looks down at me and smiles. I look up at him and smile. But it doesn't make me feel any better either. And I start thinking about this past year of my life and the things that have led to this moment. I was 20 years old. I had two big dreams in my life at that time. One of them was to graduate from college for my first degree. I was a college student, attending classes, enjoying my time there, partying with friends. I had two majors. I was busy with 27 credits. I liked the challenge. I didn't have interpreters going through school. I worked hard. I was determined. I was determined to reach my goal. I started feeling different inside. I would feel cold, I would get chills quite often. And then I would be sweaty. I started to feel a, a pressure when I would eat all throughout my abdomen, and it would hurt. I didn't know what was going on. I was a college student. I was far from my family. I didn't have a doctor to visit. I didn't really want to talk to my friends about what was going on in my body. So I just kind of put it to the side and went along with school. One night I felt particularly bad. It had been the worst I had felt. And I couldn't handle it. I was so sick, throwing up. My roommate saw what was going on and brought me to the hospital. What was going on is that my small intestine had a hole in it. Everything's supposed to stay inside your body. It's not supposed to come out. <laughs> I had to have a surgery and they cut me open with a nine inch incision, took out all of my insides and clean them all off. And that's what I was thinking about as I was wheeled into that final surgery on Christmas Eve. I was scared, but also happy. I was ready but at the same time, not ready. With my right hand, I felt down at my side. I could feel something small and red, squishy, spongy, a little bit slimy. <laughs> I 
and that was my friend named Stoma. <laughs> really, we weren't good friends. <laughs> So I was saying goodbye to Stoma. That surgery was supposed to be the end of Stoma, and all my insides would be put back in. So I said goodbye to frequent bathroom breaks with a special spray to cover up the smell after using the bathroom. Goodbye to being limited to wearing overalls every day, or jumpers, because I couldn't wear jeans or I couldn't wear pants with a belt. Goodbye, the sticky, gross lotion on my body that had to go around the stoma to protect everything and protect things from coming out of the stoma. Goodbye. I never wanted to meet you in the first place. <laughs> and now we're done. I never want to see you again. <laughs> I remember lying in the hospital and feeling so hot all the time, with fever, 103, for three weeks, infection, surgery after surgery, infection after infection. I was so hot. I had three fans pointed at me in my room at all times. I remember being in the ICU. <coughs> with my hands strapped to the rails of the bed to keep me from pulling out the intubation tube. I remember feeling the plastic tubing coming out of my nose, sucking out black infection from my belly. I remember feeling people bending over me and crying, and I thought I might die. I could smell death. I could smell it in my hair. I could smell it all around me. The surgery was done. The stoma was gone. And Christmas Day, I went to this church service in the hospital chapel. I was still pretty out of it from the surgery and the pain meds. But looking around, I noticed nine stained glass windows. It was really the first time I'd ever really looked at stained glass windows and wondered how they were made. I had a social worker come and visit my room while I was sick. He tried to talk with me, ask me how I felt and about my experience and what did I want. And I blew him off. <laughs> I didn't want to talk to him. How would he understand what I was going through? There's no way. I'm a girl with a screwed up body now. I have no belly button anymore. My dreams are in the dust. How could you possibly understand? The social worker told my mom that I rejected his visit, that I was resistant. Well, because I said, you know, because supposedly all deaf people should be nice all the time. <laughs> <laughs> because all people with disabilities are like so friendly all the time. <laughs> Since that Christmas day, I've stubbornly gone back to school. I finished my college degrees, and I attained that goal. My second big dream was to become a mother. My health had its ups and downs. I struggled to become pregnant, and I struggled through in vitro treatments. 
several failures before I finally conceived. I gave birth to a baby boy, my wonderful baby boy. I was so happy. My boy is now five. But we have our own ups and downs, of course, like any normal relationship. <coughs> Sometimes while we're driving, I'll drive past the hospital where I had my surgery and see those same stained glass windows and think back on my experiences. Sometimes I'll tell my son a little bit about what happened, what his mom went through with that hospital. Now I've decided that what I've gone through is, could maybe help other people too. And so I decided to go into the master's program to become a social worker. I have a necklace here. A friend had given it to me and it says, I can do hard things. <laughs> Sometimes I call myself a deaf super mom. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I don't really mean it seriously. It's, kind of just me being, being silly, and it's the barrier that I put up to protect my heart and my vulnerabilities and my fears. I use them to cover up those experiences that I had. But I hope I can help other people, because I've been in both worlds. And I hope I have something positive that I can give to the world. Thank you.